Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you uh, to the uh, association for inviting me to give this uh, uh, talk. I'm very glad to, to be here. So as you have seen in the title, we are going to talk today um, about the malware detection and memory forensics. My idea is to try to show, uh, to show you uh, how we can try to detect uh, malware in a memory dump. And if uh, we are able to do it, in a good way or not okay that's uh, one of the things that i would like to um, to be like the uh, takeaways from this talk okay so i'm gonna have to uh, summarize what are the open challenges and what are the uh, issues that we have and also i will try to introduce you about uh, how we have tried to overcome these uh, challenges or these issues uh, in our research group so i have also one slide to include myself, but uh, thank you, Ahmad, because you have already told everything about me. This is me, uh, like uh, almost 10 years ago. Okay, so you have a more recent picture about me. Uh, let me say that uh, I'm not alone. As you have said, uh, we have um, a research team working on all this stuff uh, regarding the uh, software security and system security at the University of Zaragoza. So you can follow us either in the Telegram or Twitter. Uh, uh, profile and also you can check uh, our uh, publications in our website uh, these are part of the team this is not uh, an updated uh, uh, pictures there are two more persons in that are not included in this picture so i'm sorry guys i forgot to uh, update the uh, picture before the uh, uh, before the talk uh, so let's uh, move to the current uh, presentation okay well, first of all, let me do some kind of recap so then we are able to understand uh, what we are talking about. This is the typical incident response uh, uh, phase, uh, uh, sorry, incident response process as defined by the NIST. Uh, we have the preparation in which the team are going to prepare everything, are going to de deploy all the tools that they, they want to have in place just in case that some uh, computer security incident occurs. Then we have the detect analysis phase, which is when uh, there is some uh, security incident that we have detected in our systems or someone else has detected and has uh, warned us about it. And then we have the analysis uh, phase in which we are going to try to uh, see what happened, right? Then we have the containment eradication and recovery phase, which uh, means that we are going to try to uh, avoid uh, the, the computer security incident to be present and to try to uh, recover the system somehow. And of course, the post-incident activity where we try to uh, uh, to have some uh, lessons learned, right, about what happened and about how we can try to uh, avoid these kind of uh, things in the future. Well, we are going to focus our talk in the detect analysis phase. In particular, one of the things that uh, we are usually doing in this incident response phase is forensics, right? Forensics can, can be of different uh, uh, type. Uh, normally, when we have a system that has been compromised somehow, and then we need to analyze what happened, we can distinguish two kinds of forensics. We can do a network forensics, which means to analyze the co network communications, uh, analyze the pickups, right, with the uh, Wireshark or similar tools, and then trying to, to see what uh, has been uh, communicated, uh, where we have the communications and what, which kind of data has uh, been exfiltrated. And then we have also computer forensics, right? Computer forensics is just uh, getting the system that has been compromised and trying to analyze uh, its uh, device drives, the disk, and also the memory. Right, so we are going to focus the talk on the memory part, on the memory forensics. So why memory? Well, there are some times that the, the access to the physical drives is very difficult to achieve. For instance, if we have a virtual server, right, or we have a cloud, uh, we have a, uh, a server on the cloud. In these cases, if we want to access the physical drives, uh, maybe it's not even possible because they do not exist, right? So in these cases, it's better to try to rely on the memory. Of course, there is also another big issue regarding the quantity of data that we need to analyze. If we are talking about disk forensics, means it means that we might have a very large disk, a very large 
amount of data that we need to analyze. Normally now we have the disk in terms of terabytes. However, if we talk about memory, it means that we are in terms, normally in terms of gigabyte, gigabyte or gigabytes, right? Remember that uh, we have the difference between the uh, uh, how they count the, the, the uh, the capacity, right? Uh, in disk, uh, we are counting it in the power of 10, while in memory, we are counting it in power of 2. And that's uh, It's not gigabytes, yeah? it's gigabytes indeed. Of course, uh, having less data to analyze means that uh, we can do a more uh, uh, fast uh, incident response phase. And moreover, there are some cases in which some data may only receive uh, be in memory, all right? For instance, if you think about fileless malware, this kind of malware that um, they do not leave any kind of footprint on the disk, uh, this kind of malware only lives in memory. And of course, they need some kind of activation somehow. Uh, I mean, there, there should be some uh, uh, traces on the disk about how they activate this malware, but at the end, the malicious code is just in memory. So in memory forensics, what we usually analyze is a memory dump, right? A memory dump is just a file which uh, represents uh, what was in the memory on that system when the memory was acquired. This means that this is a file full of data to analyze. These files are usually called memory dumps. Mm -hmm. And each one of the items that can be analyzed inside this file is called memory artifacts. Uh, these artifacts can be retrieved either using like a rep, right? Uh, you can do a, 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 a quick and dirty rep on the on the file to get uh, uh, something like a strings. But uh, normally, what we usually do is to uh, navigate in this uh, memory dump using the internal structures of the underlying operating system, right, uh, inside the, that uh, memory dump mm, to retrieve everything. And the things that we can find are mainly a snapshot of the running processes at that time of acquisition. Also, the, the users that were logged in the system. Um, we can also find traces of open files or traces of uh, open network connections. Moreover, we can also uh, find these memory dumps even recently uh, system resources that has been free, that has been used and uh, released uh, right uh, uh, seconds ago, right? This is because normally the memory is not uh, uh, zero uh, when the, uh, the systems are uh, released. Uh, we are going to talk also about volatility. Volatility is a, a standard tool, a de facto standard tool to analyze uh, memory dumps. Uh, I guess that you know that there are two versions, right? Version two and version three, which mainly uh, depends on the uh, underlying Python version, Python 2 versus Python 3. Uh, but DT3 is already a, 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 a unstable uh, tool, so we can use now DT3. And uh, uh, I will talk about uh, more about DT2 because uh, mainly most of our solutions are uh, in this, uh, has been done in, in volatility 2 So just a little more of recap. We are going to talk about malware, right? Malicious software. Uh, remember that when we are talking about malware analysis, means that we want to know uh, what is doing this uh, uh, malware in our system. Mm -hmm. We have we can have different approaches to do that. We have a static analysis, which means that we are going to analyze the binary without uh, executing it, or we can have dynamic analysis approach, which means that we are going to run the, the malware and then see the interaction of the malware with our system. There are also other approaches that are hybrid approaches that they try to apply some static analysis first and then some dynamic analysis. So there is also another thing that I need you to know. I'm going to focus on Windows uh, operating system. So I need you to know how the Windows memory works, how the memory system works. The Windows memory system is mainly uh, devoted to map a process virtual address space into physical memory. 
remember that uh, we have physical memory, right? This is the, the, the RAM uh, memory that we have. And every time that we run a process in our system, uh, there are some space of this memory allocated to the process, right? This uh, space is a virtual address space. It's virtual because it does not exist in, in real. Mm -hmm. um, imagine that in the 32-bit uh, environment, the uh, Windows environments, uh, before Win uh, Windows 8, each process has two gigabytes of memory of uh, as a virtual uh, address space. So it means that each process can uh, at least have this quantity of memory for uh, their own. OK. Uh, well, this is the default uh, virtual size that can be extended depending on the, some specifics that I'm not going to go further. Um, regarding the what is happening now with the new operating systems of Windows, uh, the uh, default virtual size, as you see, is um, 128 terabytes, which is fucking insane quantity of memory. Uh, in fact, uh, there are some uh, uh, some limitations in the uh, current hardware mm, uh, and also in the current uh, uh, operating system of Windows mm, that uh, does not allow us to use more than 24 uh, terabytes of memory. In any event, 24 terabytes for a personal computer is quite, 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 quite much money uh, in memory. So apart from doing this mapping between the addresses of the of the process to the real physical memory addresses, mm -hmm. the Windows memory systems also manages uh, paging. Paging are the process that, uh, sorry, is the process that happens when the pages that we are going to see now that pages are how the memory is divided, uh, are paged to this, are saved to this. When we have um, a lot of uh, programs that are demanding, right? Um, uh, quite much memory. Mm -hmm. So if some of the processes are not uh, under use, mm -hmm, the memory of these processes are going to be saved on disk, which will be retrieved uh, afterwards mm -hmm, when they need the, uh, these pages to, to they, they will return to, to the physical memory. They will return from disk to, to memory mm -hmm, when the, the pages are needed. This process is called uh, paging and is also managed by this Windows memory subsystem. So I'm talking about pages, right, or memory page. Uh, a page is defined as a contiguous fixed length block of virtual memory. We can have two different sizes. We have a small and large pages. Uh, I would say that uh, in all my life, I have only seen small, uh, at least in Windows, I have only seen small pages which are four kilobytes in size. And let, let me also finish this telling that uh, we can have uh, uh, a page in different states. So we have free state, reserved and committed. You have here like a picture, a, a state diagram of how the, uh, of, the, of the page state and how they can be changed depending on the uh, Windows APIs. This, these are Windows APIs, right, to change the, uh, uh, the state of a page and let me just say that uh, a process can use a page when the page is in committed state otherwise they cannot uh, uh, they cannot use the, the page so okay enough talk let me just uh, show you what we are going to do we are going to I, i'm going to show you right um, everything uh, also with a demo so i will skip now the uh, uh, the full screen and uh, I will alternate between a, a command line and also the present the slides okay the idea is to show you um, everything that I'm going to tell you in the slides but also in real right so in a notebook so I'm going to show you uh, an analysis of a Windows 7 machine which has been uh, infected with a, a, a Lina malware, which is a piece of malware uh, dedicated to uh, steal um, um, credit cards uh, from memory from another processes, which has been slightly modified for, for local connection to avoid uh, connecting to the uh, 
to the command and control server. All right, so let me show you the current issues that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that you need to know is that when we make a memory dump and when then we try to uh, get something out from that memory dump, for instance, uh, a process, right? It may happen that the content of this process, the content of the representation of that file that we have in disk, right, is incomplete. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, define these two terms that you are showing in the slides. We have image and image file. I'm using here Windows terminology. Image file means the file as in disk. Uh, image uh, means the process, okay? The representation in memory of that file, right? So what you are going to see is that, uh, is that when uh, we try to extract something from that memory, um, and we try to see the content, it may happen that this content is incomplete. This is happening for two reasons, maybe for the page swapping. As I told you, uh, it, may, it may happen that our system needs more, more memory, and then the, some of the free processes, the processes that are not being used at the moment, are going to be released. The memory is going to be released, and they're going to be, it's going to be stored into the disk. So, this means happens that if that page, that pages are not loaded in the in the memory, you will not be able to see the content. It also may happen this because demand paging, also known as lazy page loading. Uh, the operating system Windows does not bring data from files on disk to memory uh, completely, only when it is absolutely necessary. Okay, so it's only uh, going to load what is needed to load and nothing else. This is, of course, an optimization issue. Okay, let me show you this with some pictures. Mm -hmm. um, imagine that we have the physical memory here and we have two different processes that are uh, sharing the same library, in this case, kernel 52. Mm -hmm. And of course, each one of the uh, processes has a part uh, devoted to the executable code. And then uh, we will have also these uh, parts on the uh, physical memory. But if we look uh, deeper, we will find that what we will have is specifically the code pages and the data pages that are used for each one of these uh, shared libraries. So, here I have illustrated this. Imagine that the process A has only 0, 4, and 5, while process B has 0, 5, and 6, right? So this means that if you try to extract, uh, for instance, the content of kernel 32 from process A, you will have a partial view, uh, and the same will happen from process B. OK. So before going here, let me just okay i'm going to show you this way with the uh, uh with this uh, terminal i'm going to analyze that memory dump mm, which is a uh, memory dump of this windows 7 machine that i have told you okay so the first thing that i'm gonna do here is to extract the um uh, sorry to show you uh the number of uh, pages that are resident which means that they are not uh, in disk Okay, if you see, for instance, and um, here we are analyzing the uh, Alina process, the, the, the malware process. So we have almost all the pages in memory, but not all. So this means that we are missing some, we, we might be missing some behavior of the malware. And the same happens as you see with the different uh, DLLs. If you see, there are no DLL, there's no DLL fully loaded in memory. Mm -hmm. Only a few pages of them are loaded in memory, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the in the process, uh, in the virtual address space of this process. Mm -hmm. So we have done some experiments about this. Let me just uh, give you some numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to evaluate how this uh, paging works, mm -hmm. how, the, uh, how the Windows system tries to release memory, how often. 
we try to, to release memory. Here are the conditions that we set on the experiments. Mm -hmm. And let me just go to the, yeah, this is the plugin that I have shown you now. Uh, regarding the results, we find that uh, in the case of executable, so X, uh, access uh, files, almost 80% of their of them of the pages are resident in memory mm -hmm. and if we try to um, uh, overload the system mm -hmm. most of the models are going to be expelled mm -hmm. and after recovering like the normal i mean um, i mean after finishing this overloading mm -hmm. uh, in our experiments we come back to our normal state mm -hmm. uh, in this case we found that uh, less than 20% uh, 25% of the uh, pages that were uh, page to disk are retrieved okay and we also evaluate this on the shared libraries so in the dlls in this case well, what we found is that by default um, normally only 20% of the pages are written and uh, we have a similar behavior as before mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, what we found is that only less than 5% of their pages uh, becomes resident after memory exhaustion, which is quite uh, very low numbers. There are funny pictures. Uh, I mean, uh, there are good pictures about this on the paper. I recommend you to, to keep an eye on that if you want to, to know more about the, uh, the results. Uh, you can find the paper in my webpage or also on the publisher uh, webpage. So, this means that if the content of the image is incomplete, it means that it's going to be inaccurate, right? So, why we have these differences between the file in memory and the file in disk? On disk, well, it may happen that we have some page in effect. Mm -hmm. Remember that I told you at the beginning that we are working with pages, which are four kilobytes in size. Uh, this means that if there are some parts of the binary that uh, uh, are less than four kilobytes, the memory, the, the Windows memory subsystem is going to allocate a four kilobytes uh, of size. So this means that it may appear from zero padding. Okay. And there is also uh, another important stuff, which is the relocation. Mm -hmm. uh, recollection is what is done to uh, resolve the external functions or um, some other functions, uh, some other sections, sorry, inside the binary that are going to be removed because they are not longer needed once uh, the, 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 the file has been um, loaded to be run, okay, in the Windows system. So let me just put this with a figure so imagine that we have this in disk right this is going to be mapped in into memory when we run the, the program and then everything is going to be aligned to four kilobytes so this means that if our binary is less than or it's not a multiple of four kilobytes then we will have some padding for sure we will have a bunch of zeros at the end now this is the relocation i told you okay let me show you Uh, hello, uh, I believe that the voice we lost to voice. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no problem. I don't know what happened. Uh, what was the last part I have uh, uh, you hear? 
ذا لاست بارت ووز ريليتد تو ذا بيجز اند هاو ذي ار لودد ان ميموري يس سو ذيس سلايد وي ديدنت هير ات يس ذيس بارت يس يس اوكي اي واز سينج ذات اي هاف استراكتد كان 32 دي ال ال from the uh, malware process. And then I'm comparing here this DLL with the uh, original DLL. And uh, it's just a color diff. So it's just uh, so we meet the differences between uh, both files. As you see here, uh, we have already some differences in some of these bytes, right? And if we go further, you will see that there are some parts in the file which are not in the other and also happens in the other way. Mm? So as you see, there are a lot of differences between these files. And this means that if we want to compute, for instance, uh, when, we, when we want to know if a file is equal to another, uh, or if, uh, I, if the, these bytes correspond to some malware, what we usually do is to use uh, MD5 or SHA1, right? Uh, uh, cryptographic hashes. Uh, this means that if we try to compute, uh, in this case, is MD5, for instance, you see that we have differences, right? So MD5 is, are not going, or SHA1 or SHA256 uh, are not going to give us any uh, information, any real information, right? Because it may happen that um, uh, we have... Uh, this uh, module here but if we extract some other, other module from another process since we will have different pages the md5 will be also uh, distinct so it will not be a valid uh, way to know if the files are equal so to try to overcome this what you can try to do is to use uh, similarity DGS algorithms these are algorithms that try to identify similarities between different digital artifacts using an intermediate representation, which is usually a digest or a fingerprint. Uh, these kind of algorithms are usually byte-wise. I mean, they are focused on the byte stream. And instead of giving us like a binary answer, like MD5 is equal or, not, it, or it is not equal, uh, the files sorry, are equal or are not equal, uh, these kind of algorithms give us like a, a similarity score, mm, which is typically a value in the range 0, 100. It is not a percentage indeed, mm, but uh, it uh, gives us like um, an idea if a file is, uh, how close is a file to another, right? It's an artifact, sorry, to, to another. So we have been working on this. Uh, in the recent years, we propose first like a classification of these algorithms, um, telling how they work. Um, they work in two different stages. First, they try to process the input and to um, generate the artifacts, and then generate the digest. And then we have the digest comparison phase. The digest comparison phase, depending on the algorithm, can be uh, computing the uh, uh, Bloom filters or computing, for instance, uh, jacquard distances or any other kind of similarity um, uh, uh, sorry, distance metrics on the on the digest. Uh, in the paper, a part of uh, classifying uh, classifying classifying sorry uh, the algorithms, we also try to study what are the desirable properties, so which are the properties that we would like to have in these kind of algorithms in order to um, be robust against attacks. And we also try to provide some kind of attacks to these uh, algorithms. We also uh, have been working on this, uh, trying to provide volatility with uh, plugins to compute similarity uh, uh, hashing algorithms. Uh, okay, uh, no, let me just go to the R similarity DS algorithm is clustering algorithms. Mm, no, it may happen that some of the similarity DS algorithm are applying something similar to clustering to know if they are similar, but uh, 
that will be on the biggest uh, on the biggest uh, comparison phase okay not in the uh, ssd for instance is one of these uh, similarity uh, digest algorithms that maybe you know it uh, because it's really used on the on malware mm -hmm. tls uh, uh, tlsh is also used uh, as a, as a similarity digest algorithm so as i was saying this is the uh, one of the first proofings we we did in 2018 and we have also been working on this a little more and we have this plugin, which is similarity and relocated module, where we try to uh, pre-process the input to uh, allow uh, fair comparisons. Let me say fair comparisons, right, uh, between different modules extracted from uh, memory dumps. Mm -hmm. What we do here is to try to uh, undo what the, the Windows operating system is doing in the uh, file when they are loading when, when uh, the files are loaded into memory. Uh, let me just uh, show you here. Okay. So here we are computing now SSD uh, with the, uh, or plugin in the, uh, in the thing that, uh, sorry, in the, in the model that we have. Mm -hmm. And we also compute the, uh, the same in the first page and then we compare we compare and give us some similarity score so this is telling us that yeah well um, these two pages are similar okay so it's close to 100 so means that this is similar so yeah there is still another problem that we can have uh, regarding the uh, accuracy of elements in memory, which is related to pages marrying. Pages marrying means that we can have some inconsistency in the memory hmm? uh, because the, the way that the memory is acquired. So you have to think that the memory is a live system, right? Imagine that we start to uh, get the memory uh, from the beginning, right? We start to uh, in the zero. Hmm? until eight gigabytes so we start to to, to acquire the things right the bit by bit we get one bit with uh, one byte and write it to this and so on and so on. so it may happen that we have a process here right in which uh, there are some pages that are in near to the near to the end of the memory right so when we dump this structure to to the disk then uh, to the file then we say, okay, we have a reference to that other address. And then we keep saving. And then imagine that when we arrive to that part, uh, the initial process has exit. I don't know why, maybe it was, it was just a, a short process. So it has ended the execution. But however, we will keep that data that we have in memory that it may happen that it's been used by another process. It may happen that it's been, uh, used by anyone uh, by by no one i don't know mm -hmm. but we will save that content into disk mm -hmm. and we will relate that process with some uh, with some data which is not correct mm -hmm. this is known as uh, memory inconsistency this will happen uh, mainly in live systems mm -hmm. uh if we have a system with uh, which is under heavy load or with more than eight gigabytes of, of memory there are some solutions to avoid this. Uh, we can use, uh, we can freeze the memory, right? We can uh, put some liquid uh, nitrogen in the in the memory slots, and then the sorry, in the memory uh, yeah slots, and then get the slots and read in some laboratory. Mm -hmm. We can cause across them. Mm -hmm. uh, the main problem with these approaches is that once you do this, uh, you will not be able to recover the system anymore, or not at the same. I would say at the same state. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some tools that you can use to check uh, this problem, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, temporal forensics. And there is a plugin uh, from Pagani, Fabio um, Pagani, and, uh, and others that was introduced uh, some years ago, mm -hmm, which uh, tries to tell you, given a, a memory dump, uh, 
how likely it is to have this uh, page in inconsistency in your in your memory dump. So you will get something like this. So let me move to the uh, last issue that we can have is the initial triage, okay? So imagine that, well, we have detected that there is something where uh, something weird in the in the system. So we need to analyze uh, a process. The first thing that we usually do when we are analyzing malware is to look for the persistence, right? Uh, trying to see where the malware is sleeping for uh, running every time that you run, uh, you, you boot your uh, window system. Uh, however, the detection of persistence in memory forensics is difficult. Mm -hmm. This is also a consequence of the previous issues that we have seen because uh, uh, Windows registry, um, I guess you know that there are a lot of malware that uh, usually resides in memory, right? It sleeps, I would say it sleeps in, in memory, uh, sorry, in the Windows registry. Uh, however, Windows registry is volatile. Mm -hmm. It's mainly volatile. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of these uh, register keys that only lives in memory. Mm -hmm. This means that if we have page in, if we have demand uh, uh, loading, uh, lazy page loading, it means that it may happen that we don't have all the registry keys in memory, right? There is a good uh, seminar paper on this, which is uh, from Brendan Dolan Gavit, if you want to read more about the problem with the Windows registry in memory that I recommend you to read. So a few years ago, we developed this plugin, which allowed us to try to analyze a memory dump uh, with the Windows registry uh, inside a memory dump and um, tries to see if there are something weird in the registry. It's trying to look for uh, if there is a Windows um, executable in the registry or there is some suspicious path or um, some other uh, well-known shared commands. So I think that in this case, yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, wine, or proving is called WinSAP. Mm -hmm. It's not correctly working in the in the demo, so sorry for that. Mm -hmm. I haven't time to, to check why it's not working properly. Maybe this is not the correct uh, uh, dump that I was uh, intended to analyze, but let me show you how uh, is an output. So this is an example of the output that you can have with this plot. Um, yeah, in the same paper, we also do like a taxonomy of the points, uh, auto start points mm, that are commonly used by malware. So these are all the, all, all the points that you can find in a window system. And if you see here, we have a column to indicate if these uh, points can be tracked down in memory forensics or not. As you see, mostly most, uh, most of them can be retrieved, but uh, it may happen that when you try to see these keys, they are not loaded in memory, as I was telling you before. Mm. So to have here a yes does not mean that you will be able to find it. Okay. Yet another idea that you can have is to, well, let's try to use digital signatures, right? As you know, digital signatures allow us to know if um, a file is uh, has been created or you know, developed by um, a well-known company. However, uh, we develop uh, this plugin to try to see if this was possible, seek check. Mm -hmm. This tries to uh, calculate the Microsoft Authenticode signature in the processes that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the technical stuff. I'm not going to go further because I'm running out of time. Uh, but it's mainly relating, uh, relying sorry, on some internal structures of, of Windows to do that. But uh, as you will see, Okay, I'm going to leave it here. I think it will take a long uh, while. In the meantime, let me go here. We do some evaluation on the uh, on Windows 7 systems uh, on that time. And uh, what we found that uh, many of the processes 
cannot be compute. I mean, the, the digital signature cannot be compute because either we are lacking some page, so we don't have the full content. So this means that we are not able to uh, compute the current, uh, sorry, the um, accurate hash, right? Because uh, authentic code uh, signatures are mainly uh, based on cryptographic hashes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of catalog signet files, which means that uh, uh, the signature of that uh, system process or sorry, system uh, file is stored in a file inside the uh, uh, window system folder. Mm -hmm. So they are not loaded into memory. And moreover, uh, process Halloween is not uh, detected. Mm -hmm. uh, this problem is not only ours. I mean, any any tool that you can use for trying to check the digital signature of processes, something that you can do with uh, uh, a process hacker, for instance, and, uh, the same issue, the same problem is happening to these tools. Mm -hmm. um, if the uh, malware has done some process Halloween and has left the uh, uh, the the scene, uh, I mean the signature untouched, mm -hmm. um, the same is going to happen. I mean it's not only our limitation, but also a limitation of the other tools. So here you have like a, an example, right? Mm -hmm. See, here we have apply or plugin seek check, and as, as you see, there are a lot, a lot of uh, problems that either we are not able to read, or uh, it, they are not signed, mm -hmm. or we have partial content. Mm -hmm. And this will happen with almost all of the processes that we have in this in this dump. All right. So let me. Sorry. Let me leave this running and I will tell you yet another solution that we have proposed. Uh, of course, to detect uh, malicious code in the uh, in the memory down can be tricky, right? Uh, we have developed like an improvement on Malfine. I don't know if you know Malfine. Malfine is a plugin for volatility that allows you to find uh, mm, malware in the memory dump. Mm -hmm. So we made some improvement here. Uh, we have like, I would say, integrated uh, the same uh, results that uh, Malfine gives to you, but with GAN AV. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a daemon, um, an antivirus that we have on, for Linux. So this means that this plugin only works on Linux mm -hmm. environments. And uh, this plugin give us less uh, false positives mm -hmm. uh, and less false negatives than Malfine. Okay, here's how it works. Okay, and uh, we have some additional so mechanism to detect uh, malware. Uh, and as you see, here is first here we are applying uh, Malfine, right? So it's the the, the common um, plugin that we have in volatility to, to find malware. As you see, it's detecting as Explorer as a malware. I'm pretty agree that sometimes Explorer can be um, worse than a malware. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, this is a false positive, right? The same happened with the search filter host, which is a common um, window system process. Mm -hmm. And if you see Alina, the malware that is running in this DOM, in this uh, was captured in this memory DOM, is not detected, right, by Malfine. So, if now we try uh, the memory uh, to analyze the memory DOM with Mal uh, Malscan or plugin, you will see that uh, it will detect or uh, uh, the Alina process perfectly. So, well, yeah, I will go to the slides in the meantime. So let me go to uh, computer work. Mm -hmm. Well, we have been working on this uh, of memory forensics uh, for a while. Um, we have also another plugin that um, uh, I forgot to put on the slides indeed, mm -hmm. but uh, I can tell you it, this was published uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So we have developed like 
two different uh, plugins that allow us to give in a memory dump or give in a set of memory dumps. Mm -hmm. We try to join all the pages that we have in that module mm -hmm, to, um, to get uh, like the full module. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, is proposed sorry, here mm -hmm, about this improvement of completeness. Mm -hmm. We have already do this, mm -hmm. you can find uh, this plugin also in our uh, GitHub. Uh, we are also working on the accuracy, so we are trying to see how to build um, new similarity DGS algorithms uh, for binary similarity mm -hmm, and robust against attacks. That's also one of our ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also trying to see how we can uh, detect uh, code injection techniques uh, in memory dumps. Uh, of course, most of our plugins are currently for volatility too. Um, our idea is also trying to extend these plugins to volatility three mm -hmm, eventually, mm -hmm, but um, we will see if we have uh, people for, for doing that in the future. Um, and of course, we also would like to do the same kind of research, but not only on Windows, but also in some other operating systems and also on mobile platforms. And um, that's all from my side. Here you have like the references that I have uh, commented through the uh, uh, talk. And I will be glad to try to uh, answer any questions you have about this uh, presentation. So thank you for hearing.